Imagine you're in a room where time doesn't exist. Might be hard to imagine. Imagine in this room there is a beautiful go board in the middle. Seated at the go board is your opponent, whoever that may be, whether it's a friend or a stranger or someone you are playing go with regularly. And because this room has no time, you sit down at the go board and you ponder your move. But you see that the best move that you could possibly play is revealed to you right then and there. And you play it. Doesn't matter how long you took to think because there's no time. Unfortunately, we don't live in a world like that. We are stuck to this dimension called time. Just like how we're grounded here on Earth, we can't escape the fact that time is an important part of our game. As it is with pretty much any game. We can't have games going on forever. My lovely girlfriend recently got me a go clock, which is really just a chess clock with a Byoyomi setting. It's the Leap PQ9903A, and you've probably seen it if you've gone to any go tournaments. It's a burgundy colored digital clock with a packing peanut shaped switch. Or you could just call it a peanut-shaped switch, I guess. that's Those packing peanuts are named <laughs> that way because they're peanut-shaped. But it looks more like a packing peanut to me than a peanut. Anyway, <laughs> this timer and the ink timer are the only clocks I've ever really seen used at Go tournaments because they're pretty much, uh, I think, the only timers that I know of that have Yoyomi settings at all. But I call it a chess clock because it's it says chess timer on the box and it says chess timer on the clock and there's like literally a knight uh, icon on the clock and when you start up the game it, it shows you like little chess pieces to to tell you i think that there were kings to tell you which side is white and which side is black of course it's reversed in chess where white goes first in chess and black goes first in go and by now i've mentioned my girlfriend a few times and the wonderful things she does for me to support my hobby. And she always, she's always getting me all these thoughtful Go gifts and attending Go things with me. And you might be wondering, how can I find a partner who supports my Go hobby like she does? And the answer is that you need to be, you need to at least get to one Don first before people start noticing your Go skills. I'm not a one Don really yet, but I'm a one Don in her eyes. So that's, you know, I got a little bit of a pass there. Welcome to Start Point, the show about Go for Go fans away from the board. And today we're talking about clocks and time and time systems. You know, it's really hard to find clocks with Byoyomi time settings. It's unfortunate because Byoyomi is the most popular time control system for Go. It's the default setting used ubiquitously across Go servers, pro tournaments, amateur tournaments. Though the Korean League, I think, as recently as this year, adopted Fisher Time. And we'll go over what that is later on. But as we all know, Byoyomi is Japanese for counting seconds. Because when you get to Byoyomi, you start counting seconds out loud to let the players know. Uh... It's, the st it's still the dominant time control in the world of Go. As a refresher, it's a time system where you start off with an initial period of time called main time, followed by any number of Byoyomi periods, usually three to five. Uh, sometimes I've seen like the 10, you know, 10 Byoyomi period system. It's kind of like just the 10 Byoyomis that you have uh, and no main time. But once the main time is burned out, you enter your Byoyomi periods, which are typically from 10 seconds for pretty fast games to maybe a minute for longer games. I haven't really seen longer than a minute, really. 
And each Byo Yomi period is like a refreshing timer. So if you make your move before the period runs out, when it's your turn again, it replenishes up to the original duration and uh, you get to use that Byo Yomi period again. But if you used up the entire period and that time goes to zero, you lose that period, kind of like losing a life. And you begin to use your next period of Byoyomi. If you lose all your periods of Byoyomi, you lose the game. And if you haven't used this kind of time system before, it might sound complicated, but it's actually fairly simple and intuitive compared to some of the other time systems that we will go over in this episode. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm going to get through as many of the standard time uh, control systems used when we play turn-based games like this and just talk a little bit about the pros and cons of of each of them. But before we get into that, uh, my question to you is why do we use Vyoyomi and Go in the first place? Of course, there are historical reasons, but I'm asking more about what's the function of the Vyoyomi system? The simplest way to think about this could be possibly when you look at the game and start asking first why we have time time controls for this game at all. One of the most obvious reasons is that you could literally have the game last forever. If I'm sitting at the go board and I don't like the position I'm in and or it's a very complicated position, I could take the rest of my life to, to figure it out. And that's just not something that we as humans who have limited lifespans can do practically. But that's kind of how Go games used to be played back in the day. I mean, Go predates the invention of modern clocks. I mean, it's kind of hard to implement a time control system with a sundial. So applying time controls is a great way to actually get a match to end within a reasonable amount of time. Okay, so the first solution that we would think of is to give each player a specified amount of time, and when they run out of time, they lose the game. That would be like the f- simplest way to, to solve this problem, and that's that brings us to our first time control system, Absolute Time, also known as Sudden Death. What I like about this time system is that it's so easy and simple to understand. And I think that's something that I'm going to emphasize about time control systems is that I really think they should be simple and that they should be easy to understand. When we get con- like complicated time systems, I think that's when we start to lose some of the quality of our game and we spend too much time or too much of our brains using it on time management, which is something that we just want to try to solve in order to play a better game. So to recap, absolute time, each player's player gets a certain amount of time, let's say one hour, and when it's your turn, your clock goes down. It starts ticking down, and when it's your opponent's turn, your clock stops and their clock goes down. And when your clock is zero, you lose. Super simple, but No one really uses this system in Go. And I was actually really surprised to find that on chess websites that they use this time control setting as one of the default options. And I actually believe that uh, 10 minutes absolute time is one of the most popular settings on the chess websites. I'm not really sure why, because look, there's a reason why we don't really use this time control in Go. And one of the reasons is that we have games that vary in length. Games don't have the same number of moves. So I clicked through some uh, few random pro games and found one. I've, I tried to look for ones that played until the very end without resignation. And I found one like without even looking very hard. One of them ended in 196 moves and another ended in 316 moves. That's a huge difference. And that's like a problem with absolute time because you don't know how long the game is going to be. And so you don't know how much time you really are supposed to be using. And it's not forgiving at all because once you reach zero, you lose the game. So if you find that 
you've misjudged how many moves the game is going to be, that's going to be something that's a burden to you. And you can even play the meta and try to make the game longer, knowing this fact, knowing that your opponent is short on time. And Go, I think, maybe one reason why chess is more okay with it than Go is because it's harder in chess to make useless moves that, like time sujis, for example. In Go, you can kind of get away with playing a lot of um, pointless moves. But the, the point is that you know how much time you have left, but you don't know how much time you have left relative to the length of the current game. Does that make sense? And so all this leads to the final time pressure. In absolute time, the time pressure is ridiculous when you're starting to run out of time. So you're instantly going to lose the game if you let that timer hit zero to the point where you, you'll probably end up throwing stones at the board, hoping one will land on an intersection. If, if you know you have five seconds left and you're literally going to lose the game, you're going to basically want to like throw your stones at the board and just put a valid move on. Actually, fun fact, that kind of brings to mind something that actually uh, happened. If you put your stone on the board and it isn't on an intersection, it's determined to be on the intersection which it is closest to. At least that's uh, the format of one of the Korean tournaments that I saw. A player was running out of time and he he grabbed the stone really like haphazardly and threw it across the board and it landed between the points. And then he smacked the clock. Okay, if he stopped there, maybe he made a bad move, but it would have been salvageable. They just make a ruling on which point the stone is closest to and they move the stone over there. But after they hit the clock, this player proceeded to move the stone into place where he wanted it to be. And that counted as moving the stone twice. And that was an automatic forfeit of the game. It's, it's rough. It's a unfortunate situation. But back to the time stuff. So because game length can vary so much, we can easily come up with a, another solution, which is to give a certain amount of time per move, right? You can just say, hey, look, some of the games are going to be long. Some of them are going to be short. Why don't we just adjust the time system to go along with that? And that's what simple timing is called. At least that's what OGS calls it, where you have a specified amount of time per move. So you can have like 30 seconds every move. And if your time runs out, you lose. But you don't have to worry about the, the time pressure too much because you're going to have a consistently, you know, consistent amount of time per move. So it's at least predictable. You don't have to worry about how much time you're going to spend on this move versus next move. But that's where the problem arises because... Although it solves the game length issue in terms of the number of moves, the length of the game is not the only factor at play. We have complexity per move. So that also varies throughout the game. Some moves require much more time than others because of just how complicated or not complex a move is. Under simple time, you're, not, you're likely not to have enough time for certain moves that require a lot of thinking. You may have plenty of time to play, some, play your no normal moves, but you may run into a situation where you need to really sit down and analyze the situation, but you can't because you only have 30 seconds or you're going to lose the game. Which brings us to the hybrid system that we have that is mainstream among Go tournaments, which is main time and Byoyomi. This, this time system solves a lot of the issues from the absolute versus the simple times where you either have a time system that doesn't really account for the length of the game and then we have another time system that doesn't really account for the variable complexity of the game. So we have this hybrid of main time and Byoyomi where you can use more time as you see fit throughout the game but then you also don't have this insane time pressure from misjudging how much time you're going to have later on in the game. 
Now, one point I want to make is that I think this philosophy of this time system is not to spend your main time on complex moves and your byoyomi on simpler moves. That doesn't make sense because the complex moves could come later on in the game after you've used your main time. I think the point of this time system really is to treat it like absolute time with some forgiveness added. So you should use your main time wisely throughout the game and you'll be re rewarded for moving qu quickly because you'll keep that time and you will be punished for using too much time because you'll your time will dry up and you'll enter Byoyomi faster than your opponent. But if you do run out of time, you won't have to throw some stones at the board because you will still have a consistent solid padding of 10, 30, 60 seconds to make your move. And if some complexity does arise, you can burn a Byoyomi in those emergency situations. So it feels like a, a compromise between those e extremes to me. Um, but I don't think it's perfect. The most common criticism being that when you have a Yoyomi period, and you only need like a few seconds to make your move, it's a very simple move, there's no motivation to make it any less than Byoyomi because your Byoyomi will reset next turn, so you might as well use the entire Byoyomi period every single move, which is, it's going to make games longer than necessary, right? Uh, but one criticism that I feel like I don't really see as much is um, something that I find a little strange thinking about it. Because the most common time control that I play on Fox is the 5 minutes plus 3 periods of 30 second Byoyomi. And something like I, I kind of analyzed the situation a little bit and I thought, huh, this is a little weird. Like, how am I supposed to be using this first 5 minutes that I have as, of main time? Because if you use less than 30 seconds per move during your main time, for the entire duration of the main time, meaning for the entire five minutes, all of your moves took less than 30 seconds, then you might as well have not had any main time at all. Because if you had just started on your Byoyomi, you would have stayed within the Byoyomi and kept all your Byoyomi periods. So it's like, why did you even have that five minutes? So it encourages you to at least have one move that's fairly longer. Every time you, every sec, oh, here, here's, here's how you put it. Every 30 seconds that you burn using the sub 30 second time chunks, you're losing out because that's essentially a whole Byoyomi period uh, amount of that main time that you used in the manner of Byoyomi. I hope you're following. It's it's t Time can get really confusing when we're talking about all these time systems. But essentially what I'm saying is that there is there are optimal ways to use that five minutes and it's not that simple. What my, my conclusion is, is that if you have an opportunity to think within your first, in your main time, you, you should use it. You should burn the time. And you shouldn't try to save it. I mean, you can save it, right? It's it's still going to reward you for saving it as long as you use it eventually. That's the that's basically the the um the thing that I I noticed. But overall, I think Byoyomi is great. It's relatively simple. It's beautiful. Um but let's uh look at some alternatives besides the ones that we've already mentioned. Uh let's start with delay timing because it's the most similar to Byoyomi, in my opinion. Uh, now, there's two types of delay. The first is US. It's called US, or simple delay. And this is when you have a set main time, let's say an hour. And when it's your turn, you have a set amount of time known as the delay to make your move. Let's say it's like one minute. So if you make your move within the minute, you won't take any of your main time away, and on your next turn, you'll receive that one minute again, and it'll refresh. And if you deplete the full delay during your turn, the whole minute you burn it, that's when your main time starts ticking away. But when you end your turn, it's not like you lost a Byoyomi period, you, you get the full delay amount again, next turn. 
So it's like a reverse Byoyomi. It's like you put the Byoyomi period in front of the main time instead of um, after you've burned your main time. And I haven't tried this system, but I actually really like it. I, I think it provides a good balance and rewards and punishes fairly for using short or long periods of time. Um, there's not going to be any scrambling to play moves. And you kind of like have a good idea of like how much extra time you have to spend on moves throughout the game. And it's, I think it's it's pretty good. Though it doesn't solve the uh, problems that Byoyomi have. Uh, Byoyomi has like the whole, you know, using the whole 30 seconds every time, right? So if I have a one minute delay on a uh, simple or US delay, I, I'm going to... I'm going to use 30 seconds every time or one minute every time I make my move because there's no punishment to using that time. And uh, I mentioned there's two delay systems, the US and uh, simple delay I just went over. The second one is called Bronstein delay, named after Soviet chess grandmaster David Bronstein. And functionally, it's almost the same as US delay, but the key difference is that your delay time is added after your turn. So imagine you're main time ticking down during your turn. And if you use less than the delay time, then your clock will refresh after your turn to the time that it was before your turn began. And if you use more than the delay time, your clock will still add time back, but only up to the delay amount that you used. So for example, if the main time is five minutes and the delay is 30 seconds, and if you use 40 seconds, your time will be four minutes, 50 seconds. Uh, I don't like this one as much as the simple delay because it's a little harder to understand, but it's essentially, it's functionally the same. The only difference really being the end of the game where if you use up your main time, um, you'll lose the game, you'll flag, right? Uh, whereas in the US delay, you start with the delay first. So imagine you have like, 30 seconds delay, right? And then in US delay, you have 30 seconds left uh, on your main time. If you use up 30 seconds, you'll burn like, I don't know, a, a fraction of a second or whatever that it starts uh, creeping into your main time. But in Bronstein delay, if you have 30 seconds left on your main time, your 30 seconds on your main time is what's used first. So if you, if you go to zero, you'll lose. And it won't have a chance to refresh and give you back those 30 seconds. Um, but the advantage of Bronstein, I think, is that on the clock itself, you can see your actual main time versus the delay time. But the disadvantage is that it's harder to tell what part of your time you're burning. So, I mean, I, I think that can be fixed with just a better clock if, if delay became popular. You can show both the delay and the main time. And then, of course, there's Fisher or bonus time. Of course, it's named after the great chess player Bobby Fisher. Weirdly enough, I don't think the chess folks even call it Fisher time anymore. They refer to it as increment. And I think we don't call it increment because it's kind of confused with other time systems. Or I'm not really sure. But Go players, we still call it Fisher time. And if you, if you search Fisher time, I get a Google select, uh, suggested result from the British Go Association. And then there's a wiki on time systems. And then immediately after that is the Sensei's library page on Fisher time. I mentioned earlier that the Korean League recently implemented this time system. And this time system, the gist of how it works is that it gives you a bonus amount of seconds after every move. So after uh, like... Off of that, you may just be thinking, oh, that sounds a lot like Bronstein delay. But the difference is that even if you use less than the bonus amount, the full amount is added. It's always added. Whereas in Bronstein delay, if you use less than delay, only the amount of delay that you used is added back. So with Fisher, it's possible to increase your main time if you make your moves fast enough. You can keep building up your main time. Every time you make a move fast uh, under the amount of bonus time that you have, then you will gain time. And I can't really judge it because I haven't really used it, but my first instinct is that it may reward time sujis too much. If you're running out of time, you can just kind of play a bunch of time sujis and build up your time a bit. 
Uh, but maybe that works better in theory than in practice. Uh, the, the advantage of this system uh, over Byoyomi and delay is that it, it really rewards faster moves. So it can make the moves, uh, make the game uh, chug along faster. But arguably the disadvantage is that it rewards the, fa like the it rewards faster moves. So that's, that's also a disadvantage because sometimes it's not good to, for players to be encouraged to just play flat fast moves in order to get more time. But yes, it, this is the time system that does solve that problem of, of Byoyomi, where people use the full Byoyomi period to think, even though they don't need it. Because in Fisher time, hey, you, you, you don't need the time. You should just play the move because you'll get more time and you'll be rewarded. And then the next time we have is Canadian Byoyomi, which is partly an elegant solution, but overall I think it's a little too complicated. Uh, this time system gives you a specified Byoyomi period for a number of moves. So the way you do it is you take out, for example, 20 stones out of your bowl, representing the tw next 20 moves that you're going to make. And then let's say you have five minutes in your period. So that means that you have five minutes to make these 20 moves. And the five minutes will act like almost like an absolute time. But once you used all once you've used all of your 20 stones, it refreshes back to five minutes and you take another 20 stones out of your bowl and then you start again. So it's got the right spirit. It's like trying to balance out the whole uh, 30 seconds per move restriction on the Byoyomi because you can now use this five minute period in this example any way you see fit within the for, within these 20 stones. And within the 20 stones, it's a lot easier to tell like whether this is going to be an important move or not relative to the ones around the next few moves that you're going to play versus the whole game, right? Because you don't know what's going to happen at the end of the game and such. But I think it's a little... So I think it's got the right spirit. It's a little too involved for me. I think there's too much going on, taking out all your stones and counting the number of moves you have and all that stuff. And it's... Um, but I haven't tried it as well, so it's hard for me to judge. And the problems with regular Byoyomi can also become emphasized with Canadian time because, for example, if you played all your stones within the period, right? Let's say you have... Uh, 10 minutes, 10 minutes to play 20 stones, right? And let's say you've played all of your stones within the the period and you have like eight minutes remaining. There's that last stone you can just spend eight minutes on because there's no motivation not to use that the rest of your uh, Byoyomi time. So it's it's like you can even make that Byoyomi problem even more problematic in Canadian Byoyomi. But I think that covers about the... Uh, normal time systems that are out there but there are a couple of honorable mentions uh well more like one honorable mention and one dishonorable mention the honorable mention is hourglass time and i love this idea because it's so simple and you can literally use an hourglass if you can figure well if you can figure out how to get an hourglass to be exactly even on both sides but the concept is on your turn, you flip over the hourglass to your opponent's side, and then on their turn, like, or sorry, on their turn, you uh, pl flip over your glass to to their side, and then on, when they finish their turn, they flip it over to the other side. Which you don't have to use an hourglass. There are plenty of uh, clocks that actually have hourglass time built in. But basically, not only is your time burning up on your turn, your opponent is getting time, and. It's really cool because, I don't know, it just feels really simple. And I, I feel like it's it, it's like a fun time control. And I want to try it one day. I haven't tried it. Um, but I want to know if it, if you any of you have tried it and if there's like any problems with it that I'm not seeing. Because I, I heard it's not very good because it is easy to abuse. And you can try to like trick your opponent and just give them, take away their time and just try to collect all the time and be a time hoard. Um, but I don't really know exactly how, how it plays out and, but I want to, I want to try it. Um, I think it sounds fun, especially with like a smaller time control, like a one minute thing. I think that would be pretty cool. And for the dishonorable mention, 
And the last time control that I'll go over is ing time. Now this one I think is the worst out of all the time systems we've gone over today. It's a purchasing system where you have a set main time and for every sixth, I don't know why, but every sixth of a main time, it's very specific. Every sixth of the main time you use after your original main time, you lose two points. Like in the game, in the game that you're playing, like two points, like two stones. You can lose up to six points. So that means three periods of the like bonus time that the ing time, which equals about half the additional half of the, uh, the main time minus two, minus two, minus two like that. And then if you go beyond that, you forfeit the game. And it just seems so wrong to me because now you're taking the time system and you're interfering with the actual scoring of the game. And I don't like that at all. Because, like, what's next? If your opponent uses up 2.2 times the main time, you get to retake a ko once without following the ko rule. You get to take a seki and kill the kill the other opponent. I don't know. Like, there's just, like, so many rule alterations. It becomes, mo- like, Monopoly or something. And it's not really go, right? It's The time should be separate from the game, is what I'm trying to say. And uh, that's... That's my opinion. If you may have a different opinion, if let me know if there's any other time systems that you were hoping to hear about that I didn't go over. I think I covered most of the the main ones. Um, if you look on a chess clock, there's just so many variations, and it's just it actually takes a long time to um, understand a lot of them. But um, yeah, let me know if there's other time systems that you like that I haven't gone over. And now for a small personal update, um, I'm just chugging away through my one done games on Fox. I and I told you I've been I've been saying that I don't like stable games where people have bases, right? <laughs> where where people have bases and there's no fighting and we're just kind of trying to take territory and edge each other out, but. I was playing a stable game this past week and I was just kind of trying to be solid and conscientious about my moves and just waiting, just waiting. I happened to rip through the opponent's territory and found some corner Aji to take up to, to take the whole game. And it's like, you have to sometimes be very patient with go. And although you may think that nothing's happening, just wait, and sometimes magical things can happen. A little bit of Go news. Uh, The Asian games have started. Um, The Asian games, uh, if you don't know, are kind of like an Asian Olympics. It's recognized, actually, by the International Olympic Olympic Committee. And uh, some people describe it as the second largest multi-sporting event after the Olympic Games themselves. And I mentioned the Asian Games because Go is featured in this year's Asian Games. And that's actually pretty big because the last time Go was in the Asian Games was in 2010. So it's not always featured as um, a game in, in the Asian Games. And so we, I think every country uh, is sending out two representatives. Um, so far, we got a few results. Um, one of them being... Xin Jinzhao versus Yang Dingxin, who is the the one who was kind of caught up in controversy a while back, accusing Li Hao of cheating. Uh, ever since then, uh, things have been resolved. Uh, he has apologized, I believe. But Xin Jinzhao versus Yang Dingxin, spoiler alerts, coming up ahead. Xin Jinzhao takes it, and it's actually quite uh, an interesting game. Go look at uh, Go Inside's channel on YouTube for a pretty good review of the game. And then we have on the other Korea versus China front, Park jong versus Ke Jie. Ke Jie has kind of been on, uh, behind the scenes lately. I uh, haven't really seen his name much uh, after he, he's been, he'd been dominating the Go scene for a long time. 
Koja takes it from Park Jong Wan. Um, those are just two of the wins that I want to mention. Um, maybe I'll do a, an update later on in a future episode. And we have some news about the AGA. There's actually a pretty nicely written article about one of the meetings that they had on Baduk.news uh, called What's New with the AGA. And in that article, they describe that they uh, discussed the 2024 Go Congress, which will be in Portland. Now, Portland is kind of close-ish enough for me to maybe consider going. I have never been to Go Congress before. But the proposed dates are for mid-July, and they uh, haven't finalized it, though. And son of a gun, they're talking about time controls on this episode. I just happened to find out that AGA, the AGA is moving towards Fisher time. And that's interesting because that, that is a huge uh, leap in uh, the trend because we have one Korean, one association, the Korean League, implementing Fisher time, but you don't know what's going on with that, whether it's going to be a temporary thing, whether that's going to work out for the players. It's just one turn of, like one system that's using Fisher time. But with the AGA deciding to go with Fisher time, it's it feels like things are changing in the Go world. I'm sure there's a lot of traditionalists who will cling on to their Byoyomi time, but hey, I'm open to it. I don't know how it will feel. I'm used to Byoyomi and just waiting every time for the, the countdown. Five, four, three, you know? But that's kind of cool. I think um, the whole speeding up is something that a lot of Go players may want or look for because Go is by nature a longer game than chess. So it may benefit for from... Uh, some rewarding of faster games. And now it's time for Mish- <laughs> Mishner Lail. It's time for Listener Mail. Listener Mail is a segment of the show where I get to respond to things that you have said or wrote in to say. Havoc Prime on Reddit says about episode three, Go Etiquette, Rudeness, and Metagaming. I'm really enjoying the material. My Go Etiquette horror story involves my first time at a local Go Club group. I'm a DDK and the person who was hosting the group was 3Q. I was very excited to be playing offline, but then he would walk around and blab commentary at everybody not as strong as him about their moves during the games, saying things like, Oh, that's too slow. Why did you do that? Are you sure you're an even match for this game? Anyway, I didn't really go back to that Go Club. Yeah, that's, uh, I'm sorry that happened to you. Uh, I think it's a pretty standard rule among Go communities. No kibitzing. So, I don't know what uh, he was doing, just commenting on moves. Maybe there was a, maybe there was a, already like a culture in that club where people uh, appreciated comments being made about their game so they can improve and they just kind of take it casually. But as a new player, probably shouldn't be um, trying to call them out too quickly. But thanks for writing in. There are no bleeping names left, uh, writes about episode four, The Importance of Winning. I think you might be interested in this Mindscape episode. Uh, and then they link to Sean Carroll's Mindscape episode 169. Winning is what makes a game a game. Thank you so much for writing in. There are no bleeping names left. Uh, I actually ended up listening to that entire episode and it was super interesting. I think. One of the things that I found so interesting was the concept of the achievement versus striving gamers. Um, Just a quick summary would be there are achievement gamers who really just, it's important to win. And that's something that they really want versus striving gamers, which they focus more on the struggle of the win, but not exactly on the result. And I definitely know how that feels because when I play something that's not Go, when I play board games with my friends, I know there are strategies out there to win these games, but I don't care to know about them. I actually consciously avoid, for example, there's a game called Splendor, and it's, it's a really fun game, 
And I feel like if I really wanted to win and get better at the game, I would look up the strategy on exactly what I'm supposed to do. But I don't do that because I, I just like to, I don't want to uneven the playing field. I just want to have fun with my friends, right? That's something that's difficult about Go because anytime you want to play with someone who doesn't play Go, their level is going to be, of course, way lower than yours. So it's going to be hard to connect. Um, yeah, and then there's like that monopoly strategy where if you uh, buy up all the houses, people don't have enough houses to build and you can kind of really create a monopoly of houses and just win the game. But yeah, the, there's some interesting uh, ideas in that uh, podcast. So uh, thank you so much for sharing. I really enjoyed it. Um, and then uh, Go Gabe Go, the uh, YouTuber, of str- uh, one who runs Struggle Bus, also writes underneath that comment, uh, quotes, Rainer Knizia, when playing a game, the goal is to win, but it is the goal that is important, not the winning. And says, I've always liked this quote. Thanks for writing in, Struggle Bus. I I think that's basically everything I wanted to say during that episode four. That it's the goal that is important, but once the result happens, it's not as important as when it was during the game. Does that make sense? I, I'm just butchering the quote. Just just listen to the Rainer Knizia quote, and uh, I'll stop talking. Thanks for writing in. Uh, Rural, Rural writes for the importance of winning. This is the first episode I've listened to, although I do plan to listen to all of them. I enjoyed the discussion. I think you brought a lot of salient points together. Well, thank you. While listening, it occurred to me you could have mentioned pure games of chance. The pure ga- sense of winning is similar, but in skilled games like Go, you have the chance to do something about it. Huh. Yes. Winning in a game of chance still feels like winning. So, that's a curious little uh, observation. And also, something I learned from the Hearthstone community, in competitive games, the win rate for most people is around 50%. If it's a little higher, you're getting better, or are underranked. In a fair two-player game of chance, the expected win rate is similar. Is that why the benefits of stuff, I think there was a typo, are hard to grasp when viewed in terms of winning? Your win rate will increase for a while, then drop down again when you are matched against stronger players. As others have suggested, you could consider the odd guests, although you're doing a good job at a single presenter radio. Thanks for writing in, Rural. Um, yeah, I've actually dabbled in Hearthstone a bit. And in, ca- in competitive video games in general, the matchmaking will try as best as it can to even you at around a 50% win rate. But the two-player game of chance... You know, there are lots of games with chance probability, but I don't think there's a lot of popular games where it's purely chance and a two-player game the only things that can really be like you know if you're playing that card game called war where you just whoever has the higher card wins i don't think those games are really popular like poker is a chance based game but it has a lot of skill and so i don't know yeah there, there is this phenomenon where if you are playing a competitive matchmaking game you're expected to win around half your games because they're trying to find people who are as strong as you to play. But um, the uh, request for the odd guest, I, uh, I've, I've heard a few times already and possibly in the future, possibly in the future, uh, we'll have to uh, set things up and uh, get my bearings straight for that. But thanks for writing in. Uh, Rach. Hello, Rach, again. Thanks for writing in again. Uh, episode number five, Ladder Anxiety and Training Mentality. It says, check, check out The Glory on Netflix. It has the best portrayal of Go in movies and shows that I've seen so far. Thanks for writing in. I, I've i actually seen that show. It's it's actually, yeah, pretty good because it's a Korean show. And so they know what Go is, <laughs> at least. So they're not like scrambling to put nonsensical sto- stones on the board and... I think the people who've made the show actually has a sense of what the game is about too, because it's kind of clearly emphasized in the plot, but uh, I wish there was more of it actually in the show, um, because that's like the main part that I was interested in. But there's uh, something noteworthy about that show. There's a scene, there's a few scenes in this amazing 
outdoor public go park where they have these giant go stones and there's these go tables set up that are all lit up at night and everything. It's so amazing. It looks like go heaven. I really wish there was more places like that. Um, thank you for writing in. There are no bleeping names left writes about episode five, ladder anxiety and training mentality. The rhombus ga- shaped game is hex, which is the actual John Nash claims to have invented although that's disputed, so that is probably why it's in the movie. It's a beautiful and elegant game, and I wish more people played it. It has a lot of similarities to go. Uh, you know what? I actually would be down to play it. There's a we, there's a game that my brother got me for Christmas one time. It's Hive or something. It's an abstract game. I've only played it a couple times, but it's kind of interesting, and it reminded me of Hex and Go. Edit. Uh, after watching the deleted scene, I'm convinced that the ridiculous things he says about Go are on purpose to show how badly he deals with the limits of his intelligence. It's not me, the game is flawed. You know, I haven't seen the movie, so I can't say whether the, the director is trying to show that he's so smart that he can confound the rules of an ancient board game, or if, yes, what, what you're saying is true. If, if what you're saying is true, then yeah, that's, that's fair enough but it it doesn't make me think it's any less ridiculous. Thanks for writing in. Legacy Cobb writes about episode five, ladder anxiety and training mentality. Great episode. The game is truly beautiful. The stones on wood are naturally appealing to me and like you, I love the way the world melts away around me. Playing in person makes me feel so good. Playing online is an exercise in frustration. Part of that is ladder anxiety, but also part of that is that I can't lose myself in the game like I can over a real board. Thanks for writing in. I, I actually constantly lose myself uh, in the game online as well. And it's actually not very frustrating because it feels low commitment, you know? But thanks for writing in. And the question of the week today will be, what is your favorite time control system? Let me know and why. You can DM me on Reddit, comment on Reddit, or shoot an email to starpointbaduk at gmail.com. That's starpointbaduk at gmail.com. Thanks for listening, and special thanks to commenters, contributors, reviewers, and play, uh, play, play, go. Keep playing, go. Bye.